there it is. Okay, we are recording the the um, uh, this this session, and I'm going to go over some logistics. So Dr. Walter will speak for about 15 or 20 minutes before uh, and give us an overview of the subject. And, um, and we encourage you during that time to actually send in questions that arise um, uh, in the chat uh, room. And um, and and uh, although most of us have become rapidly proficient in uh, in Zoom, the chat window will appear if you click chat in your controls at the bottom, and then you can see it show up on the side. Um, and uh, and then I'll, I'll assemble those, and then once Chris um, finishes, I'll start with those questions. But then if we run out of them, we can, we can entertain some questions verbally and uh, just keep yourself muted beforehand. And then, uh, and then when, it comes, when, I get, when I call on you, then you can ask a question and we'll go from there. So please allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Walzer, who is the Executive Director of Health at Wildlife Conservation Society. And the Global Health Program has been integral to our conservation programs around the world for so many years. And it is specifically a response to the urgent need to simultaneously address the health of people and animals, recognizing that disease poses challenges to both conservation of planets by biodiversity and efforts to improve the, improve the quality of human life on Earth. So Chris is a board certified wildlife veterinarian. His work over the past two decades has specialized in the Gobi region of, of Mongolia and Central Asia linking wildlife health with the conservation of wild horses and asses in particular. But beyond this work, he's internationally recognized with diverse expertise on many um, facets of wildlife, many different critters, um, and gained from combined years of leadership and research in Europe, Asia, and Africa. He's authored many, many books and, and other publications, um, book chapters and lectures widely. And he's been all over the place in the current situation, explaining to media and many stakeholders and politicians the science behind the origins of the crisis, sort of similar to what he's gonna be doing with us today. Last week, he testified before the US Congress. And this week, he was one of the experts featured in an Earth Day um, uh, feature in the Globe and Mail um, uh, by our science reporter, Ivan Semeniak. And I've pasted the link in the chat room at the very top. Um, Dr. Walzer is the recipient of several research and uh, science awards and is leading WCS's engagement in this space. Um, can you please mute? Sorry, do other people hear that too? I hear it, yeah. 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 Okay, I'm, actually, it, yeah. I have power to mute. It's great, great. Um, okay, so. Uh, uh, anyway, this great uh, Earth Day feature in the Globe and Mail, and Dr. Walzer is a recipient of several research and science awards, and he's been leading WCS's engagement in this space. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Chris, and thank you so much, Chris, uh, for, for doing this for us. Thanks very much, Justina. Thanks very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. Good afternoon from the Bronx. Um, I, uh, I'm just going to... Oops. I'm not going to do anything because it's not working. There we go. Um, I assume you know everyone who's on this call is is obviously um, sheltering at home and um, has been following the this uh, pandemic in the past few weeks at least, or some of us since several months. And you've probably all read every single book about pandemics out there. Um, so I'm just going to try to summarize it to quite simple things. What do we know? What do we not know? Um, what are the things we can do? Uh, what's WCS doing? And try to put that into a context and try to provide some um, context to um, Canada and the, and the temperate regions of the world. So what do we know? We know that zoonosis are diseases that move between animals and humans. Um, they don't only spill over from animals to to humans, they go both ways. So depending on the species, sometimes um, humans are actually the big, the big problem, as we see in our primates, for example. Um, most of the emerging infectious disease, so those are the new infectious diseases, are zoonosis. And of those, about 72% of them have a, a reservoir in, in wildlife. So the role of, of um, wildlife in emerging um, infectious diseases is really, really important. And the frequency of these emerging diseases is increasing. In the past 50 years, um, we've seen a marked increase in these um, infectious diseases. You know, some of them um, 
you, you've all heard this, but HIV, of course, Ebola, the, the various influenza virus outbreaks, SARS, Nipah virus, Hendra virus, and so on. So there are a lot of them out there. Some of them have um, severe impacts, but none of them have had um, HIV, of course, from its, um, from its reach and impact and, and the morbidity and mortality it's caused is by far one of the most important zoonotic diseases. But um, this COVID-19 is, is obviously also causing significant distress, mortalities, and um, obviously impacts. One of the things I want to point out is that this is nothing new that, um, that diseases um, transit from, from animals to humans. Probably one of the most you know, well-known diseases from, that we've acquired from animals is measles. Um, measles was originally a, um, a cattle disease, and um, as we domesticated cattle, um, we were exposed to all the diseases of the cattle, and one of them that we retained and then made it uniquely our own is measles, for example. So what do we know about this coronavirus outbreak? So we do know that sometime in November, most likely, there were some cases of uh, pneumonia, uh, specific pneumonia circulating in the area of um, Wuhan. Um, by the end of December, um, WHO, uh, WHO was notified of this um, disease. Um, there was not any talk at that time that it was a human to human transmitted disease. Um, and pretty soon, beginning of January, there was a, a link to this wildlife trading market in Wuhan, the, the so-called seafood market. And um, that was closed quite quickly at the beginning of um, January, on the 2nd of January, I think. And um, then by the 13th of January, we actually already had a, a sequence and we knew that it was a coronavirus and within days also knew that this coronavirus was linked to, to wildlife. And of the first, um, set of uh, cases, the ana analysis of the first 88 cases that were known at the time, about 50%, just a little less than 50% actually had links to the, to the wildlife market. So what is it about these wildlife markets that's so special? The, the thing you, that's really important to understand in these wildlife markets in Southeast Asia is that the animals that are being sold there are alive. So that means they are able to shed viruses for days. They're obviously not in best welfare um, holding conditions, so they're absolutely stressed. They, um, they excrete um, the, the excrements and secretions and urine. And then at these markets also, you have a huge diversity of, of wildlife species, 50 to 100 species in some of the large markets all together stacked on top of each other and brought in close contact with domestic species, mostly poultry and, and pigs. And then, of course, add into the mix all the people that are, that are customers or vendors there. So, um, and you bring together animals which do not occur in nature anywhere near each other. You know, pang you know the famous pangolin, for, which has been brought in from Africa, potentially sitting on top of a snake from South America and on the Southeast Asian um, civet, for example. So, one of the things that's, the market was closed down immediately. And all the animals in that market were unfortunately removed. And I use removed because we don't actually know what happened to them. I assume they, they slaughtered them. Anyway, they got rid of them. They just, we don't know. They were not sampled. But one of the things that sort of got a bit forgotten in the last um, month as this, as this progressed is that there were 500 um, environmental samples taken, 500 and a bit environmental samples were taken after the market had been cleared out. And there were 33 positive samples. And of those 33 positive samples, 31 of them came from the Western part of the market, which was the part where the wildlife was um, housed. So there's a very strong signal just from the environmental samples that the wildlife um, trade was uh, uh, involved in some form or other. What do we know? We do know that the ancestral or evolutionary host of this virus is, um, comes from a horseshoe bat species is a widely distributed um, group of bats uh, throughout Southeast Asia and China. And the alignment on the entire genome, and this is important, the entire genome of that virus is 96%. So that's already quite close. 
and um, but that virus did not have the properties to enter um, a human uh, a human cell. So that's important. Um, I just want to take one step back and just say we've been WCS together with our partners with support from USAID and others have been looking at these viruses and pathogens at market interfaces the past 10 years, uh, slightly more actually, probably more than 15 years. And what that has shown is that um, wildlife just invariably carries, naturally carries and harbors uh, a high number of, of, of viruses. Just in the bats alone in the Southeast Asian context, there's some 500 coronaviruses which have been described in the past. And, and these vary, of course, some of them are very um, distinct and far away from the present SARS cluster, but others um, are much more closely. And just to put it into context, um, there's about 1.7 million unknown viruses in mammals and birds. And of those, about 700,000 are thought to have the potential to create a zoonotic disease and infect humans. So that's a lot of um, coronavirus, uh, a lot of viruses out there. And basically one assumes that for every known coronavirus, there are thousands of unknown ones. Just to put it in context, as you probably all heard this discussions about um, creating a vaccine and that's gonna be a vaccine that's gonna end all basically. So what are the things we don't know? So what we don't know is if you look here, um, we do know in MERS, another um, MERS Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, we do know that the host is most likely a bat. It's actually an insectivorous bat. It uses a dromedary, a domesticated camel species, to transmit the virus into humans. In during the SARS-1 outbreak in 2002 and 2003, the ancestral or evolutionary host was again a bat. It used the civets and the raccoon dogs at, at a market interface to infect humans. And um, here we know that we have a bat, but what we don't know is what is the um, what is the intermediary host and if there even was an intermediary host. I have to be quite clear about that. And there's been a lot of media attention about this. You've read about this all the time, you know, it starts out with the bat soup and then there was snakes and then they came from space and whatnot. And then of course the pangolins got a lot of um, um, media attention in these last uh, few weeks. And it's just very important to remember that the, the virus found in the, in the Pangolins is very distinct actually from the one that's circulating right now, but the receptor binding capacity of the, of the viruses that they found in pangolin is quite similar or very similar to the one that's out there right now. However, it's not a simple case of reassortment. So um, the pangolin at the moment is off the hook and we just don't know. And it's important just to say we don't know and what people are working on that, of course. So to put it really simple, this whole um, outbreak and pandemic is really not about soups, civets, or pangolins, or anything else you can come up with. It's all about interfaces. It's about the interfaces between wildlife and, um, and humans. And these interfaces, which are um, so important for these spillover events, are just increasing across the world. As we encroach the environment, as we disrupt the environment, the interfaces um, are increasing, and basically the disruption shakes loose the pathogens if you want. It's a sort of a very um, simple image. The more you disturb, the more you, you disrupt the, the integrity also of the um, pathogen um, ecosystem there. One of the things we have found out about the markets, which is also very unique, and I'm happy to talk about why this interface is so unique, is that as you move a rat, in this case, we just take these um, um, rats, which are a you know, mainstay of some of the um, wildlife that's being used in the market, and you move them through along the value chain from the field to the restaurant, the prevalence um, in, in coronaviruses just goes way up. So if you're gonna eat a rat, it's better to prepare it out the field where you caught it, because you'll, you'll have you know, one in five chance of having coronavirus. And then as it moves along the value chain, as it comes into contact with more and more wildlife species and other rats and so on, then um, the prevalence goes up. At the restaurant level, um, it's basically every second rat has a high percentage or uh, is, is positive for coronavirus. So this, this amplification through the live trade at the markets is actually quite an important um, specific factor. 
in this interface. So while we say the interfaces in Southeast Asia are very special, you know, we're calling them super interfaces because of the extraordinary magnitude, the size of these markets and the number of species that are, are brought together there. Um, it's important to realize there are many other interfaces as well. And if you look at the left hand side here, you'll see a, a logging road going through a uh, forest. And uh, you know, there's one way of looking at it and that's a road that goes from A to B. Um, the other way of looking at it, and if you're working with diseases and spillover events, you see this very, very long line of interface between the intact or more or less intact forest and the road. And that road nowadays obviously feeds into a, a city and the cities have been growing. And um, this interface basically has been shown that along this road, um, you'll have about 500 meters to a thousand meters you can walk into this forest but you know it's it's quite difficult in the tropical forest to to move a long distance but 500 to a thousand meters is being exploited and there's trapping going on there and while in the past all that trapping would have been for um, um, uh, su sustenance in the local community now you'll walk to the road and you may um, just sell your your wildlife and it, and it will move along the road and be in a, in a large mega city within a few hours or within a day and from there of course anywhere to any point in the world. One thing I want to point out this is a, a graphic I've taken from, um, from a colleague in, in, in Bozeman, Montana from Raina Florey but it just sort of um, exemplifies how difficult it actually is for viruses to spill over. It's not something that is so super simple and thankfully because otherwise we would have a lot more um, pandemics basically the virus has to first mu is mutating naturally but has to acquire the the possibilities to switch species or host species um, for that it needs to adapt its um, receptors and then it, if it once it has that and it, let's say it manages to enter a human cell it has to first uh, furthermore be able to reproduce in the human cell and then only very, very rarely will it actually be able to transmit from human to human, which is the case for this COVID-19 um, version of the coronavirus, which is um, which makes it so such a huge issue because it's actually being transmitted by a respiratory way from human to human. But just be aware, spillover events happen all the time. They normally have very little consequences. For, for us, if you know, if you if you uh, spend a lot of time in the woods in Canada and you you hunt, and um, you come in contact with wildlife, and you look at your blood and look at the antibodies you have, you've seroconverted against a whole bunch of um, potential pathogens without ever realizing it. Veterinarians, for example, like myself, are, are are known to have antibodies against all kinds of stuff because of the the way we interact with wildlife and and domestic livestock. So as I said, along these roads, you can you can move the, the the wildlife that's been hunted and trapped, and it becomes instead of becoming a community resource um, for indigenous peoples or local communities, it's suddenly something that's going to be traded in in a larger city, and it's on its way to you know the, and the larger cities in in Africa nowadays. If you look at um, Kinshasa. So multi-billion uh, inhabitants in these cities, so with international airport and so on. Now, and from a perspective to um, to Canada, if you look, I've just taken this example, and um, you know, I come from I come from from Austria, and we hunt in the in the Alps, and uh, uh, you know, this is a chamois uh, that we chamois um, that we use, and it makes you know great sausage and, and, and meat from that. Um, and that's, you know, been going on for thousands of years and um, the similar, obviously, in Canada and uh, in, in the northern, in the boreal forests and in the Arctic. And um, one of the things that's important, if you look at the red spots along these maps, those are the areas of high biodiversity. That's where a lot of species live. And in the areas where a lot of species live is also where there's a lot of viruses. So the risk obviously is higher at 20 degrees north, 20 degrees south. But it is important to um, realize that it's not like there are no signals. There's not much going on in Canada, but if you look here in Scandinavia, 
and um, Europe, you will see some red spots. And that is the fact that um, you consume wildlife, there is a certain risk for some kind of spillover event to occur. Remember, um, there's a big difference between a spillover event that spills over into an individual or into a community and something that then develops into a pandemic. And the, the potential for some to develop in a, into a pandemic is, is um, you know, depends on many factors. One of them, of course, um, of your health system not picking it up early. But um, I just want to point out in our, you know, we always like to tout our Alps as a pristine, uh, you know, wonderful environment and everything. And our chamois, of course, are fantastic. And so is our red deer and whatnot. But um, in the past um, two decades, we've seen an absolute maximum increase in tuberculosis in these alpine environments, which is, it's a health risk for humans, but it's even more a health risk for our livestock industry. Um, because there's an interface between wildlife and livestock as well. And it's changing, you know, it's getting a lot warmer. We're losing a lot of the, um, uh, we're losing the ice, of course, the glaciers. Our wildlife is moving up and so does cattle. And um, so this is a situation we have quite similar um, in, in, in the northern latitudes. The change is just a lot faster um, as it is in the mountains. It is the further north you go. So your pathogen um, will change as well. Now, one of the ways to adapt this, now taking it on, on purpose, taking an example from the WCS project, the health program runs in the Republic of Congo. Um, we are obviously very, very supportive and um, work together with um, indigenous peoples and local communities to provide uh, so that they have access um, to wildlife to, to meet their dietary needs high quality dietary needs and protein needs. And, but one of the things we've done, because this is an Ebola endemic area, is that we've worked with them to have an early warning system. So there's a lot of community outreach. We have this sort of a network. It's, it's pretty informal, but it, you know, even in Africa now, in Northern ROC, you, you work on, on, with a normal phone and you get a text message from a hunter in some village who says, look, I just found a dead gorilla. Um, can you come and check it out? So we'll, we'll deploy, the team will deploy to head out into the forest. Um, and uh, as I said, sorry, this is sort of just a lot of outreach on what you should do with the wildlife. But back to the gorilla, the team will head out and then collect samples from that gorilla. Obviously, this is all in, you know, in super hazmat kind of gear. And this paired with modern technology allows us to actually sample on site. So in this case, um, what you see there, which is an old, looks like an old iPhone, is actually an old iPhone, is drives a, a PCR machine, which is a handheld um, molecular diagnostic machine. And with that, we can uh, determine within 45 minutes if that carcass is Ebola positive. And the other thing you see on the other hand is actually a, a sequencer, which we can now also use in the field to do um, full genome sequencing, basically, of viruses if we wanted to. And um, all this happens uh, very, very quickly. Um, in this case, when the carcasses are negative, both for anthrax and for um, Ebola, we do a full necropsy and then uh, process the samples. Uh, subsequently at a central lab. So you can see this community engagement as an early detection and to prevent the spillover events because we really mustn't neglect, you know, we have this sort of idea, the dark heart of Africa and it's a long way away. But honestly, from these um, communities, um, there's a Chinese road up that goes up to the north of Congo. Now you can walk down the road, sell your monkey 12 hours later, that's in Brazzaville and they'd be at a party and next day the sick people, someone gets sick, gets on a plane, flies to Paris, and you know, you can, you can work out the rest. It's just this interconnectedness which um, really uh, drives a lot of things. So while it's important to know the difference between, you know, the risk between temperate um, areas and um, tropical areas, we, we have to be aware that there is no zero risk when you're consuming wildlife. There is no zero risk when you consume livestock, though it is um, decreased. One of the ways to, to address this is with a holistic health approach. And this is something WCS has been um, you know, a champion for 
back in 2004, they developed these uh, Manhattan principles on One Health. And this year, we, um, with the help of the German government, um, developed, um, a, a basically upgraded them after 15 years to more tightly integrate the, the environment, climate change, and similar things. Basically, just to give it a simple um, thing is what we need is a really a holistic approach to health, which integrates um, animal health, wildlife health, ecosystem health, human health, but also the drivers, climate change, socioeconomic, sociocultural um, drivers. We need to integrate all of those if we want to um, avert future um, epidemics and obviously pandemics as well. And a lot of this is obviously context specific things we do in the Republic of Congo are not applicable in detail, of course, to areas in, in the northern boreal forests. That's, I think, quite obvious. I, I put this slide here because it's one of the things that sort of gets a bit under, undervalued at the moment. While um, we, we're talking a lot about banning the trade of wildlife um, for consumption, the commercial trade um, for um, consumption, especially in the, these urban areas in Southeast Asia with these crazy markets. One thing one also has to clearly put in context, um, wild meat um, from a healthy population and with a respective adapted immune system. So if you've hunted them all your life, you do have an immune system that's also adapted. It's certainly in, in most cases, a lot healthier than the alternative. And definitely the, the food types on the right kill an inordinate amount of people every year, which is orders of magnitude more than any virus um, goes out and kills. Um, it's just much more, um, it's much more hidden, of course. So um, that's something to keep in mind um, when we talk about impacts and risk and so on. And then finally, just um, a word on, on WCS's um, policy and mess messaging at the moment. Um, some have been put out a bit by the very blunt uh, messaging originally. I think, you know, in the media landscape we live in now, the initial messaging has to be blunt. We were addressing uh, uh, Southeast Asian markets of an incredible scale. But I really um, invite each and every one of you to, to visit the much more nuanced policy in the background. So it's basically permanently and uh, the commercial trade in wildlife for consumption. We're, going to, we're working a lot, with, as was pointed out, we're the, one of the largest counter wildlife trafficking organizations in the world. So we're working to, um, to reinforce that, and especially as we see as there's going to be a slight pivot into illegal um, trade. And then obviously working on changing the consumption behavior, especially in, in the cities. And honestly, it's interesting how uh, civil society in China and throughout um, Southeast Asia have well reacted and reject the use of um, wildlife as a food source at the moment. There was actually a BBC story today about how um, companies are scaling up the use of alternative meats in, um, in China, which is something which was unbelievable four months ago. And then basically, obviously, we're also mainstreaming these um, One Health approaches to address um, health concerns. So thanks very much. And you know, I'm really happy to discuss this, take um, questions and discuss this with you and Christina. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. That was that was terrific. And and just to, before I open up the floor for questions, I, I just wanted to um, Reemphasize a, a couple of messages that uh, Chris uh, put at the end, which related to sort of how WCS kind of first really focused on on the wildlife trade aspect itself to to banning the markets for consumption and had very blunt messages in, in that respect. No other countries around uh, China will act until China um, shifts its laws, and and that might be something, Chris, that you can uh, give a live uh, report on because it does seem to be uh, shifting in that direction. But um, the nuanced messaging is also really important. Uh, one of you has already asked in the chat room about um, what what are the the risks in 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 our in North America, which uh, which Chris went into shortly after the question was asked, 
and you know the chances are of a, a, a being so the source of a pandemic of having the constellation of factors are, are low at this moment but still the messaging about the interface is, is still very uh, important we have several diseases in north america that have started in this way uh, path, uh, through pathogen spillover, uh, not causing mass mortality or pandemic by any stretch, but but certainly um, uh, affecting the health, our health overall, and when, and wildlife health in general. Some of the messaging that we're working on, um, we've got a, a paper that's coming out or a document that's coming out very shortly on the relationship between ecological integrity, so how the natural systems are are faring. Um, and uh, emerging infectious diseases and looking at the science behind that and what, what clear messages happen about the relative risk across the world in different geographies, but, but and, and at the same time, what that says about, um, uh, you know, uh, that, that interface question that, that Chris was talking about previously. But we're also working on an actual uh, really pointy headed piece about, uh, about the, the exact um, uh, the, the, the host of uh, pathogens uh, and, and so on that are in Arctic and boreal environments in particular to try and frame that in a way that people can be under, can understand about what are uh, what 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 is out there, what are the relative risks, what are the factors uh, that relate to it, and mostly in the context of of um, hunting and consumption of wildlife. Um, and so that will take a little while to come out because it's, uh, and we're working with, you know, uh, experts on this. We have expertise in our own house led by Chris, um, and, and that'll be something to look forward to. But we hope in general that we can, um, we can provide more information on that in particular tailored to the, uh, to the context of can Canadian conservation. So I think I'll open it up for questions. Um, and uh, one, one question that, that has come up um, uh, is, is what's the value of the wildlife trade in Asia and, and, and whether China has reopened? And also, can you talk a little bit about the, the legal um, framework right now for China which, um, and, and, and what's being worked on there and the likelihood of a ban? Um, you're muted, I think, shoot. No, you're not muted, but I can't hear you anymore. Somehow you're not, you don't, we can't hear you anymore, Chris. <laughs> and we're not, and we're not muting you. Okay. Nope. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, go uh, ahead. My gosh, the technology got the better of me then. <laughs> um, so uh, this process with um, with banning, and so it's been very impressive actually to be part of this. Um, so basically at the beginning of January, it was clear that this market in, in China was at least associated with the outbreak. And um, within days, the, the Chinese administration banned absolutely in the entire country all trade of wildlife for any reason whatsoever and not only did they ban it they actually enforced it because you know the first thing you say well all right it has a ban but because we have an office in in china and have lots of a good network of ngos that we work with um we we immediately were able to assure ourselves that this ban was being implemented so within days there was practically no wildlife to be found anymore on markets and restaurants, on e-platforms and so on. And then at the beginning of February, the president of China and um, 11, a, minister, a mixture of ministries and administrations issued a statement that they were gonna move from this um, temporary ban on all wildlife to a permanent ban on all wildlife related to consumption. And since that day, um, basically under the leadership of our team in, in China, the health program has also been helping, um, you know, revise or review and then advise on new legislation. And there are three pieces of legislation which are being worked on at the moment. That's the animal epidemic law. And I'm using these words because these are the machine translated words. Sounds a bit corny. Animal epidemic law, the wildlife law, and the animal, um, I think it's the livestock law, I think is the, the, the correct term. All three of these pieces of legislation are being reworked. And um, 
it's been an interesting process. I've had to sort of go back to school because I haven't done any veterinary public health in the sense of, you know, um, farm to fork um, process. Um, but I've been looking at this, you know, article after article. And what you can see there is very clearly that the legislation could in no way ever pick up any kind of um, disease outbreak. That's just just the way the the the, the um, the structure, the way it is structured and the kind of um, control measures that were in place. So that's moving really fast. We're, we're very optimistic that this will be enshrined, this ban, this permanent ban will be enshrined in, uh, in legislation in China within the next two months when the People's um, Committee, no, it's the Central People's Committee, the analog of the, the parliament can sit again after the coronavirus outbreak and we think that's going to happen in the next two weeks uh two months the the good thing is there was an immediate um, follow-on from vietnam at the beginning of march the prime minister of vietnam announced that similarly to china vietnam would also ban the consumption of wildlife um across irrespective if it's legal sustainable um illegal, everything will be banned. And um, both China and, and Vietnam can definitely enforce this. So we're pretty sure that's going to um, come very, very quickly. That's going to be a major change on a global scale. Um, and then we hope there's a follow on. And there's indications that Cambodia, Lao, PR will follow suit. I think one that's we're unsure at the moment is Indonesia has very, very large markets. They always a bit more independent, I would say, and so we're waiting to see what happens there and support the administrations. I think is that is that good? I think that's yeah, it. that that's great. And in fact, you you asked answered another question that followed it uh, with that that last bit about what the other countries are doing. Yeah. Um, you hinted at it a bit when you spoke about the the, the One Health framework. Uh, you know, back back in. Uh, 2004 and and the one that you just uh, reinvigorated in uh, in October of 2019 with the Berlin principles but um, there's a question about w whether you could say more about habitat conservation in general and its links to enhancing or preventing pathogen spillover yeah so as I was um, pointing out you know it's all about the it's it's mostly primarily about this interface and as the interface increases between wildlife and um, and humans, there's just more opportunity for spillover events to occur if we, you know, concentrating now on infectious diseases. And it's mostly on these sort of these um, frontiers of destruction. It's exactly where where the where the forest is being, um, if we look at forests, where the forest is being disturbed and logged and encroached on. Those are the areas where you see the strongest signal of spillover events. One of the, the, you know, the classic examples in, in disease um, transmission is when you start deforesting, it, if you clear it all and put asphalt down, that's good. There's no more pathogens, you're all good. But obviously you lose of all the other services, um, you know, um, related to climate change and CO2 and everything. So obviously that's not an op option. And who wants to live in a world with um, asphalt? Um, so, but at these edges, this is where people will walk and interact with the forest on an increased scale. So this is where the pathogens will be transported out. And I think the, the one way to look at it is when you, when you take a dead animal, you shoot something or you take it alive and you transport it, you also take with it all the pathogens it, it carries. It's like a suitcase and that suitcase is full of pathogens that have a potential. They constitute a hazard. And if you give them enough opportunity and you do this often enough, you will actually be able to get a spillover event. That's why the markets in Southeast Asia are so special, just through the thousands and thousands of animals that are there. You just, it's a numbers game, basically. It's when you play a slot machine. Um, at, at least this is how I assume a slot machine works. I've actually never done this. But you, you keep throwing pennies in or whatever, and then at some time, <laughs> Probably it takes a long time, but then you suddenly get whatever it is that aligns and you'll, you'll, you'll get a winner. And that's when the virus wins and manages to slip through all the barriers, basically. The other one that you see a lot is changes in, and I think this is something you need to be aware of also in Canada, of course, and I'm sure you, I'm sure your public health authorities are already monitoring and modeling this, but as the temperatures rise, 
um, you're going to start seeing um, vector diseases um, expanding along the east coast at least. And I think you see quite a nice signal there already. And that's basically related to, you know, mosquitoes um, moving northwards. And when you start deforesting, um, you actually select for certain um, mosquito species. And unfortunately, it's basically always those that transmit um, infectious disease. So the classic examples, deforesting, partial deforesting, really racks up the, the prevalence of malaria in, in Borneo, for example, increase in Zika throughout Mesoamerica where deforestation happens. So those are things you do need to be aware of. Yeah, and uh, a question that came to mind uh, when you were talking about that relates also to the um, a question that um, somebody has asked. The tigers in the zoo, the, there's been, there's been um, now, and there was news this morning that there were a number of other large cats. So there are eight in total that have tested positive in, um, in, uh, in the Bronx Zoo and, and has had quite a bit of attention. Um, and, and one of the interesting things about that was that they actually showed symptoms themselves. And, and you know, how, with these viruses um, in the markets, are they, you know, are there incidents where they're showing symptoms of this? Or is this more about the novel disease that emerges afterwards that, that, that has those unique properties? And so most of the, in most cases, the, the host reservoir, the reservoir host does not exhibit any kind of symptoms at all. That, that can vary. Of course, there are diseases where ultimately in, in the long term they may exhibit disease, but normally these are carrying, these are just potential pathogens normally. They're viruses which are not causing any harm in one species. And as they mutate and switch species, they can induce uh, disease. So um, just to link to the, to the tiger so it doesn't get more <laughs> value than it should. So yeah. all these tigers are doing well, first of all, and the lions, everyone's doing well. They had very mild disease and um, they're on the way um, to, uh, to full recovery or have fully recovered. Um, and I, I just always want to point, I, I've been asked this a lot, even though it's not my specialty and my, it's mostly my colleague, Dr. Kelly, who, who takes care of these animals. But I, I always like to tell the story. My, my father sent me a text message that, you know, my father seems to feel that he needs to inform me on COVID on a regular basis several times a day. But he did send me a, a text message and said, and he, I think he got it really well. He said, oh, I thought social distancing with tigers was the norm. And that's the point. If you stay away six feet from a tiger, you're not going to infect the tiger. So, and we, we see that with domestic cats. Um, yes, a few, a handful of domestic cats have um, seroconverted and have tested positive on PCR for um, COVID, but um, they're housed together with someone who's uh, shedding the virus day in, day out over a long period of time. So it needs to be put in context there. And um, I can see there's a question of, and I'm just gonna answer this because while I'm yeah. on my tiger, my little tiger story here, um, the, the, the um, experimentally infected cats, and you, you know, experimentally infected, just to put it in context, means someone takes a, a syringe with a lot, of, a lot, a lot of virus and shoots it up your nose, basically. Um, a lot more virus than, you'd probably be able to pick up in a, in a long night in a bar with 15 other people that are already positive. Um, in this experimental setting, cats were actually able to um, transmit the virus from one cat to another, but in, also in the domestic cats, none of the cats really exhibited strong um, symptoms. So the virus can get into cat cells, but obviously cannot induce, at this point in time, any kind of significant disease. Yeah, so are there any other questions? Uh, we've run out of um, chat, uh, chat questions and if you're welcome to raise your hand uh, using the, using the uh, signals uh, below um, uh, under more or um, actually where are the, yeah, the, the raising hands are somewhere. <laughs> but, um, or just, um, or just uh, unmute yourself and ask or, or, or signal to me in the chat room in some fashion. I'm watching very carefully. Um, but um, I do really appreciate your perspective on, on the Canadian situation that was, uh, or North America in particular. 
and and the fact that you need these these this constellation of factors generally that um, with so much biodiversity the moving the animals around putting them on top of each other eating eating of a wide diversity of animals um, and and all of those constellation of factors together before sparking something of this magnitude um, here's a question. Obviously, there's not a significant legal trade in, in, in wildlife in Canada, but there are policy changes. But are there policy changes that Canada should be considering for wildlife management and animal agriculture? Um, and, and you obviously don't know the policy uh, framework all that well, but did, are you aware of, of, of things that are being considered either in um, North America or Europe uh, that, uh, that, that are acting ahead for, for something that, uh, of this nature? Well, you know, one of the things I brought up is, is tuberculosis. That's and and you've had um, you know back back in the back I'd say back in the day. I'm sure you still um, have issues with tuberculosis, but um, I think famously Saskatoon was a, you know one of the core areas. I think where you you had these outbreaks of um, tuberculosis in your cattle herds, but the origin was in, in farmed wildlife in in deer. Um, so this is something we're seeing throughout Europe. This has become a really, really big issue. The reservoir of tuberculosis in wildlife and it's multiple species. It's uh, in red deer, but more worrisome for us in Europe is that it's in, in wild boar. And while with climate change and the warming, the wild boar population has exploded. And I know Justina, you know it quite well up in, uh, in Berlin in that area, but it's unbelievable. So wild boar has reached this a level um, throughout most of uh, many parts of Europe where normal hunting is never going to be able to control it. Uh, Austria has a 24-7, you can shoot day and night. They've even allowed scopes now to shoot at nighttime. Uh, it's hard to get a wild boar and um, especially because there's a lot of um, culture behind it so hunters do not are not um, targeting the most um, efficient um, population reduction <laughs> shots they, they have some anyway so, so this has become a huge problem wild boar red red deer um, badgers um, are harbor the, the bacteria and that is um, really seriously impacting the economies of, of multiple countries so that's a problem and has been a problem throughout uh, Canada and North North America um, in the US um, and that Working with that, of course, um, requires um, a lot of investment and infrastructure to deal with it. Then you have the CWD in, in deer. Um, chronic wasting disease. Chron sorry, yes, chronic wasting disease, um, which obviously also is an issue. And you can see how fast the situation changes by um, Norway acquiring um, chronic wasting disease. Um, very surprisingly for most of us. Um, two years ago, basically, in their reindeer herds and, and some individual cases in, in moose as well. So um, any kind of movement of wildlife um, has to be well reflected on and also the farming of wildlife, intensive use of um, landscapes to farm wildlife needs to be carefully reflected on. I personally have um, huge problems when they start feeding wildlife, um, feeding sites. Um, I've been, I've been fighting a 15-year <laughs> war against hunting association, feeding wildlife in the high Alps. Um, you know, you get the agglomerations in the winter, animals move about a thousand meters during the winter and mycobacterium, the bacterium that causes TB, can persist on feeding um, troughs for, for weeks on end during the cold months. So these are the kind of things you need to reflect on. Um, and this movement, the unregulated movement um, of wildlife, I don't know how well it's regulated in Canada, but at least um, in Austria, we've got a, quite a nice bunch of people who are moving these things around at night, right, left and center. I don't know if that happens in, in uh, Canada, but you know, it's quickly loaded on a trailer and it's a thousand kilometers further um, sold uh, the next day. So those kind of things are, make there's a lot of concern about that not so much for for human um health not directly and certainly not on a epidemic scale 
And just a few notes uh, uh, to follow up on Canada specifically related to those points. Um, I'm not so sure about wildlife movement. I can think of a few uh, examples where that could be tightened up a bit more, but, but also uh, one area that will probably need a bit more attention is kind of baiting baiting for um, for hunters uh, there there's you know you do that to attract uh, bears and you do that to attract deer it's certain so that they can uh, come to you uh, and you don't always have to find them that's a that's a, a fairly significant practice here all around um, uh, we also have uh, wild boars are moving um, and spreading here uh, significantly in Canada as well um, one of the epicenters in Saskatchewan that you hear quite a bit about and chronic wasting disease has had a, a high profile recently. It, it is it's significant in Montana. There's no there's no um, record of transmission from from uh, uh, to humans, but there is concern about um, about it coming from the deer farms into hunted uh, uh, animals and and the. the and the question marks about that and that's in BC in particular in British Columbia there's been a lot of um, action on that uh, from the government side to try and find surveil for this disease and and find it but um, uh, and prevent uh, prevent it to come or, or or find it immediately when it arrives and that is not yet happened here but very nervous about it being right across or ac across the border um, a couple of we should we have just a few more minutes. Can you just talk a little bit more about climate change, and uh, and 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 how it might be expected to to and the mechanism for why uh, it would be expected to increase these occurrences? Right. So um, obviously, when you look at something in a in a one health lens, then um, climate change is like the big driver over the top of everything because it's changing landscapes. Um, it's changing pathogen distribution ranges. Um, and, it, you know, this is particularly known up, um, just an example out of Canada, of the northern, um, uh, the communities that eat seals, for example, that hunt and eat seals, the, 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 the change in the ice coverage is really changing um, the distribution of seals and the, which seal, where the seals are coming from and the pathogens they bring with it. So you always have to imagine the climate change changes your, your, the hunted species, it changes the vectors, and basically also changes the, the, the pathogens that they have access to. And if you're getting seals coming from further uh, away now, you're also bringing new pathogens in, and the communities that have been hunting them for you know, eons um, may not have the antibodies um, necessary to deal with that. So, you know, we, we always talk about these landscapes of pathogens, but the other one that, that sort of pairs together with it are the, um, the landscape of the immune response. So um, if, I, if I go and eat a, a seal today, um, somewhere in Northern Canada, it's probably not gonna be great. I'm probably not gonna do great the next day because I'm just not adapted, basically from a microbiome, but also from my immune response. And so you can imagine that if, if the pathogens change, um, that, you, that you could start seeing, you know, spillover events into, into communities, which you need to pick up quite quickly. Um, and so that's why I was also highlighting this importance of, uh, you know, community-based epidemiology, community-based um, early detection systems and knowledge, so that you can, you know, if, you, if we, if, if, what are we, 27 of us sit to, down tomorrow and, and celebrate and eat, uh, let's say we go out and hunt a moose and then we eat it and half of us have fever the next day. Well, it'd be really good if we would pick up on that and say, hey, how are you feeling today? Mm, not so. And then we don't all just, you know, ignore that and maybe get on an airplane and fly to, <laughs> to Toronto or wherever. You know, I think we need to start thinking about these things more dynamically and we need to put in place the, the knowledge and the understanding of what the consequences are. Um, and, and so climate change everywhere, and as I said, for the vector of borne diseases, that's massive. The change in tick ecology, mosquito and vectors, that's really huge. And you're seeing some outbreaks of um, diseases in, in Canada and wildlife, which um, which are which are quite baffling actually, and I'm sure there's a, a climate signal there. Quite so strong. you mean up in the in the Arctic, in the systems, Arctic like the musk oxen and and musk oxen. die offs, yeah. yeah. That's a really um, a very you know from a pathologist sort of point of view, really super interesting. But it's also baffling how that's happening in the spread of the 
erysipelotrix. Um, that's quite interesting. And I'm sure there's a strong climate um, signal there. Yeah, and, and these musk oxen have died in, in, in significant numbers, like whole groups have just dropped dead and been found these carcasses. And that's been happening in earnest for about six years or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so <laughs> um, I think we're going to wrap up if that's okay with you, Peter. Um, uh, do we have any other questions um, from, the, from everybody? So, so, so thankful for everybody's interest. And, um, and we will have a recording uh, available and more materials that will be coming. And I want to thank Peter in particular for, um, for, for sparking this idea and entrusting us to deliver. Um, for Chris, for taking his time. He's in enormous demand these days with, with doing things like this and testifying to Congress and whatnot and at the front lines. Uh, so we really look forward to more from that. And, and thank you so much, Chris. And we're more than happy to follow up with any of you on, on specific questions. And, um, and for um, you know, any way that you might want to know more about how, how we're working on this and, and how you might want to help, uh, very open to uh, more dialogue on that, on that question. And uh, thank you so much. And I, I think with that, we'll, we'll adjourn for the day and, and take care, everybody, and please stay well. Bye-bye. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Justina. Okay. Thank you guys. That yes. was awesome. Oh, thank you. Well, that's Chris. <laughs> I really appreciated that. That was that was just great. All right. Okay, we'll talk thank to you later. Be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you so just much. Peter. That was okay. Great. Okay, Thanks, so I've Peter. got I've got to stop recording, but I'm terrified to do it because I don't know what's gonna happen. Thanks. It's all going to blow up. <laughs> you're good, you're good, you can do that.